Thank you for the introduction. My name is Robin, and thanks to SciLife for inviting us to join you today for this presentation on six ways how the metaverse is going to shape the future of pharma. From our perspective, the metaverse is really going to impact every aspect of the pharmaceutical industry, including quality. And as a medical communication agency, Six Degrees is always looking at the future and how communication is going to be evolving. Carolyn? Yeah, thanks, Robin. And hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn. Um, now, today's talk to set the record straight isn't going to be a technology one. So apologies to those who are looking to get into like the nitty gritty of the metaverse. Um, there are actually plenty of publications that do a great job of that. Today, we actually really want to focus on more of an anthropological look at the metaverse and how it will actually help drive better human connection. And in terms of our world in pharma, biotech, med tech, and life sciences, how can we really create better quality connections across all of our key stakeholders, whether they be internal, external, such as HCPs, as well as patients? So Robin, first question, we are hearing a lot about the metaverse these days. Can you share how this came to be? Well, the concept of the metaverse has become increasingly popular. Um, really, it's becoming a bit of a buzzword, actually. And this concept shot into prominence after Facebook's mid-year earnings call in 2021, which is just over a year ago, when Mark Zuckerberg announced huge investments in building out the metaverse, as well as a rebranding of their parent company, Facebook, to Meta. But as foreign as that may seem, it's probably not as alien as you might think, because we are, in many ways, already living in some version of the metaverse. So consider things like digital identities and avatars or emojis, which is probably, you know, the most basic form of an avatar that many of us have probably experienced in some form or another. There's this idea of digital relationships that we have. E-commerce is already, um, some, you know, out there in many respects um, using things like um, blockchain and cryptocurrency, online shopping, I'm sure something that all of us have become very familiar with since the onset of the pandemic, and digital education. There are many examples of how uh, the education environment has changed years to take into account a more interaction and greater um, uh, environments in which these uh, educational initiatives take place. Yeah, so I guess, Robin, if we're already living in a version of the metaverse, um, maybe I want to ask you a question first, but also ask the audience to maybe reflect on the same question was, when was the first time you had heard of the concept of the metaverse? I mean, for me, the idea was um, probably the, when I heard about blockchain and NFTs. So blockchain you know, I didn't have any idea what it was all about, but my son actually started to invest in uh, blockchain and educated me about it at that time, which was um, yeah, well over a year, year and a half ago. And then NFTs last year around this time, I actually heard from a you know, business colleague that one of their employees made $10 million selling a digital image of a monkey and was able to retire. So those were my first experiences with uh, with this concept of metaverse. How about you? Yeah, and I, I think, Robin, you're probably representative of a lot of individuals in the last couple of years been made aware of this concept of the metaverse. Um, my journey was a little bit different. It had to do with Second Life, and this was back in a previous organization I was working in. As so I was around 2011, 2012, um, we were looking into this as an initiative for one of our clients who wanted to buy real estate in Second Life. So for those who may not have heard about Second Life yet, this is an online multimedia platform, allows people to create avatars, so very like classic metaverse concept there, interact with each other, um, create content, play a game simulated type activity. Um, and at its peak for Second Life, there was actually 70 million registered accounts, but on average there were only about 40,000 concurrent users. So in a way, Second Life really never took off and, and has been now replaced by other newer concepts of the metaverse. Um, so I guess, Robin, we've spent a little bit of time looking back or backwards on the metaverse, but maybe for our audience today, we can share with them what our presentation will cover. Thank you, Carolyn. So what we're going to be covering today, um, we'll start with a little bit of a primer about the metaverse. 
then we'll um, share some use cases um, for the pharmaceutical industry that may be um, interesting for you. And then we'll wrap up with a bit of an overview on how we believe pharma can help shape the metaverse going forward. We will also have around 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So please type any questions that you have into the question box and we will take those during that session. We've just shared our journey with the metaverse, but we know each of you has your own journey as well. So before we move forward, I would just like you to take a moment to um, type into the Q&A a box on your screen, um, the response to this question on a scale of one to five, how knowledgeable are you about the metaverse? With five being a Mark Zuckerberg level expert, or one um, being I'm new here, or somewhere in between. Okay, so in order to define the metaverse, it can be helpful to say what it is not. Carolyn, can you take us through some common misconceptions? Yeah, of course, Robin. I'm really interested to see all those um, inputs come in from the audience around their level of knowledge of the metaverse, and hopefully we can help um, supplement some of that today. Um, so in terms of common misconceptions around the metaverse, um, a lot of people you know, anticipate, could this actually replace real life? Um, and today we'll talk a little bit about how actually it's the opposite. It's really meant to enhance our real life with a digital version of it as well. Uh, another common misconception, because we will hear a ton about the role of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality in the metaverse, that that's all it is, which is not true. And we'll show you some other really key components to the metaverse. Uh, another one is it's only about gaming. What is really interesting about this is that some of these enormous multiplayer gaming platforms have shown us what's possible about the metaverse, um, but the metaverse will include all aspects of our lives, whether that's learning, education, um, uh, social time, anything to do with business or organizations, so it's gonna cover a lot of different aspects of our lives. Uh, and another one, people may think that the metaverse is a distant future. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of a timeline later in our presentation that it's actually a lot closer than some of us think. Um, so Robin, even though we promise this not to be a lot of techie stuff today, we've already thrown around some technical type terms. So maybe we could also cover for the audience today um, some of the important technology terminology. Yeah, sure, Carolyn. So I'm just going to share, you know, some of that terminology with you. Um, the first being AI. So I think many of you probably know um, what AI is, artificial intelligence. Um, avatars, as I mentioned earlier, um, is a key component of um, the metaverse and how it will be used in the future. Blockchain, we've talked about, and as well as cryptocurrency, one of my favorite acronyms, MMOR. <laughs> PFG is um, something that stands for massively multiplayer online role playing games like World of Warcraft. Um, NFTs, I've already mentioned as well, and I'm sure people are familiar with that. Um, I think one of the things that many people will start to become more familiar with is this concept of Web3 or 3.0, which is really this idea of um, being able to have a much richer online experience interoperability as well as interaction on a whole different level than what we have experienced up till now. And then um, XR, VR, AR and MR, extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality and um, MR meaning multimedia. Mixed, mixed Sorry, reality. Mixed yeah. reality. Always miss that one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you know, with with that, maybe what we can do is delve in a little bit more to cover off what we call the five W's and H. So let's start with who? Over to you, Carolyn. Yeah, of course, Robin, as you know, I love five W's and an H, so let's dive into it. Um, the first being uh, who created the metaverse? Let's start there, um, which is a really interesting concept, actually, and a little bit of interesting history is that when we think of the metaverse, obviously our, our minds go to virtual and augmented reality, avatars, a lot of the language that Robin's just shared. 
but actually it has its origins in one of the most um, traditional methods of sharing information, which is storytelling or literature. So in fact, actually the metaverse term was coined by the author of the novel Snow Crash from 1992, uh, in which he combined the term meta, which is a Greek word meaning beyond, and obviously a truncated part of the word universe. So why this, while this book was really about a dystopian view and it really embodied the concept of metaverse being an escape from the real world, um, this was the first time we had actually seen it documented. Now, there is some really great literature um, provided by John Radoff. We encourage you to go and take a peek at some of his work. And what he summarizes, there's actually not only over 160 companies that are actually currently actively building in the metaverse, but they're actually across about seven different verticals. So the idea here is that we are only just really scratching the surface of what can be built in the metaverse, which means there's really a potential and possibility for all of us to actually help contribute. Um, but John Radoff summarizes seven verticals, which include infrastructure, so how all the pieces are connected, human interface, so these are things like wearables and whatnot, like a VR headset, uh, the concept of decentralization, so Robin's talked a lot about blockchain and AI and other tools that support that element. We've got spatial computing. Uh, that relates to modeling and different frameworks. The creator economy, so what is so important within the metaverse is not only will combine our digital and, and real worlds, but also it establishes a digital economy. The sixth part is discovery. So how, if all of this material and content is available there, how does one find it as a user? And then finally experiences. So all the different types of applications, um, engagements, et cetera, that can take place across the entire spectrum of our lives. So I guess with that, Robin, um, what we should cover probably a simple definition of what we really mean when we're talking about the metaverse. Thanks, Carolyn. So, you know, when we think about what the metaverse is, it's really the next iteration of the internet that seamlessly combines both our digital and physical lives. And it includes a number of features. You know, there are basic features that include the sense of immersion, this idea of real-time um, interactivity, and user agency is this idea of being um, part of the social world. And then the full vision for um, the metaverse is that you'll have interoperability across a number of different platforms and devices. You'll also um, have concurrent and simultaneous interaction. And there'll be a number of use cases that will go well beyond gaming, which is probably the most um, well advanced uh, example right now of how the metaverse is starting to evolve. Okay, so Robin, um, you've mentioned now that if the metaverse is met, meant to be the next iteration of the internet, I guess like where are we on that journey related to the internet? Yes, I mean, it's definitely a lot to get your head around. So maybe we can take a bit of a broader definition of how um, this relates to the to the web, right? So, you know, just um, to simplify it a little bit, we started with web 1.0, which was primarily text-based interactions, using the web for email, for example, or doing searches. Then we moved into web 2, which was more media-based interactions, where you had um, a lot more interactivity than what we saw in uh, web 1.0. And then the next generation will be Web 3.0 or Web 3, which is this 3D environment where you have um, user experience and you connect with each other in a much more interactive 3D type of way. Okay, so that's definitely really helpful. I guess my next question related to that, Robin, is that if there are different levels of the web, let's call it, and we are currently in web two, how is the metaverse itself different from the web? Well, you know, I think the main difference between the metaverse and the internet really lies in their purpose, right? With the internet, you can be online without necessarily interacting, you know, you can be online searching for anything, um, really. Um, but you really don't need to interact with any other person. 
Um, the foundation of the metaverse, on the other hand, is all about human interaction in a digital way. So it's really about this idea of sharing the universe, a virtual universe together. And the applications extend to work and school and education or just for fun. So, you know, just to reiterate, I think what we're going to see is a much richer 3D interactive immersive type of experience when we get to a full version of what the metaverse is going to be able to offer us. Okay, so Robin, now that we're, I think, pretty clear on uh, what the metaverse is, how this relates to the web, let's cover where is the metaverse? So, strictly speaking, the metaverse is an entirely virtual universe. It has no physical presence whatsoever. And as Robin's now described, it's located in the latest version of the internet called Web3, which we're on a journey towards. Um, there are, however, in pop culture, some good examples of the metaverse um, that have helped influence, I think, a lot of what, how we may think of it. Uh, for those uh, who might remember the late 90s, we've got The Matrix. Um, that was a version of their digital selves um, living in a virtual world in some elements. Uh, and then another more recent one that some may have heard about is the 2018 film based on a book, but um, directed by Steven Spielberg is Ready Player One. So in terms of where the metaverse is, we've covered that. Um, where are some really great examples of the metaverse that you could start actually exploring today? So we've mentioned Ready Player One. Uh, we've actually also mentioned Second Life. So while this may not tick all the boxes of the metaverse and how Robbins describes some of the basic features, um, it does have some very common elements that will allow you to explore certain parts of a metaverse. Uh, the, one of the best examples is Meta Horizons from obviously the organization Meta. Um, and what this is a really great example of, they have three types of metaverses and you can actually move around in between all of them. Um, which is why it makes it unique, but they've got Horizon Workrooms uh, for work-related activities, Horizon Worlds, so you can exist in your daily life, and then Horizon Venues, where activities and events take place. Uh, on that events sort of venue side of thing, the next really great example is Fortnite. This was actually originally on a gaming type platform, but the developers quickly realize the ability to bring together a lot of people for various activities. And now it's actually hosted several really big concerts from some really big performers um, and drawing huge, huge crowds. So Fortnite's also a really great example to explore. Uh, we've got Decentraland. We mentioned that one a little bit earlier. This is probably one of the best examples around combining gaming and blockchain. So we do suggest to take a look at this. There's also a lot of advertising in that space. Uh, NVIDIA Omniverse is a little of a different example from the rest. It's actually built on like Pixar Animation Studio um, platform, and it's really meant to be a collabor collaboration space for design type firms or designers themselves who help build digital assets and elements that can exist in the metaverse. Um, Roblox, we should really pause and look at this one for a moment. It probably has some of the largest number of users, about 50 million um, active. And this is really one of the best examples of a huge video game with thousands of players at one time within their own space. And because it attracts a certain younger audience, we're already seeing a lot of brands in there doing um, various advertising and other engagement activities. The sandbox, as we kind of wrap up, is a really good example of NFTs and real estate within the metaverse. And there's actually some very high profile celebrities and other big organizations that have already bought some very large um, aspects and real estate within this space. Um, other side is still in development and actually not available to access just yet, but it's going to be an interesting example of gaming along with NFTs, where actually your NFT itself becomes one of your like game players. So this will probably showcase some new ways the metaverse can be leveraged. And final, number 10, Pokemon Go. Um, the reason why we have this on the list, it is probably the best ultimate example of augmented reality, where we are really blending our real lives and an element of the metaverse through an augmented reality platform. Um, so we do encourage you to check out that one as well. 
So Rob and I talked a lot about different examples, and even though not all of these check the boxes in terms of like the ideal version of the metaverse that you described, um, I guess the next question is, is then Robin for you is when will the metaverse be here? Well, I mean, how you answer that question is actually going to be dependent on how you define the metaverse, right? So if we take the position that the true metaverse is, you know, this one integrated, you know, beast where you can move from one immersive experience to another in a seamless way, then that's possibly very far in the future. By this definition, though, the concept doesn't fully exist yet, since it will require a single universal world that is interconnected, like the internet is. So, you know, if you think about it, there's no single app, you know, named the metaverse that can be opened. It's it's more of this concept that we're talking about. But if you define it, if you define it as a series of, of um, or multiple metaverses with different experiences that are shared by different organizations on different platforms, then the metaverse is actually already here today. But that, you know, being said, there will not be a single date. You won't be able to say, oh, the metaverse started on this date in this year um, because it is an evolving process and there'll be layers and layers that will be added on over time with both technology and infrastructure development that will be needed to support the operation of the metaverse as it is predicted to be in the future. So it could take five to 10 years before some of the key features become mainstream, but aspects of the metaverse exist right now. Ultra fast broadband speeds, uh, virtual reality headsets, um, persistent always online worlds are already up and running, even though they may not be accessible to everybody. And, you know, it's said that by 2030, a large proportion of people will be in the metaverse in some way. So there's a lot that still needs to come together. And, um, you know, one of the most influential events over the last couple of years that has helped us to actually reimagine how we can interact and communicate um, differently and more, you know, effectively in many respects is what we all shared during COVID. I mean, COVID actually forced us to go online to for most aspects of our lives, from meetings to work to shopping, um, to education, like every aspect of our lives went online overnight. And so this really opened up, I think, a lot of opportunity for people to understand the potential for virtual experiences. And I'm really excited to see this next stage um, of, you know, the internet, which in my mind will be this more immersive experience. We also want to think about the market as a primed market and recent rise in the metaverse and the investments that people are making is really just progress, right? We've um, we've started to see AI and AR, VR, uh, this idea of digital twins, cloud computing. These are all um, technologies and advances that um, have allowed us to get to where we are now. Um, you know, right at the beginning of COVID, uh, the entire telecom industry, you know, had to change overnight. And, you know, with no warning whatsoever, I think the market is primed for the future. Um, but, you know, with all that being said, you know, maybe I'll throw this back to you, Carolyn. Why is the metaverse important? Yeah, of course. And maybe this is really a summary, right, Robin, of all the different potential opportunities we're seeing as a result of this primed market and these two elements coming together at maybe what was the right time. So the first being is the metaverse could be really important in helping connect people uh, and removing the barriers that physical distance can cause. So Robin's already shared some examples about what that could look like. Um, in particular, when it comes to our work environment, how can we make that remote work environment um, and enhanced through improving interactions amongst colleagues? So if you could imagine instead of us being on a 2D video call for most of the day, why not be in an immersive uh, platform uh, surrounded by our colleagues around a virtual table? Uh, we've talked to some examples of digital events, so those experiences could be far more immersive uh, in the metaverse, and that can range from entertainment to other types of 
uh, business or uh, educational activities, uh, which leads us to where we see a huge potential of why the metaverse is important is to really improve online learning and education by improving communication. Um, and in particular here, this is where we see a lot of opportunity of training across all different types of sectors and industries, uh, including QA or quality elements across really every organization. So we'll delve into it a little bit more in our case study section, um, but wanted to start this idea of how learning could look different in the metaverse and how will we know if we're really on the right track. So we believe truly that the metaverse will ultimately transform learning by creating these really engaging experiences that are human centered and goal oriented. And to know if we're on track, this idea of leveraging uh, a tool that we're really familiar with, which is the learning experience design concept, which is built on adult learning principles. So we can all agree, of course, that adults have specific needs when it comes to learning. However, those concepts are from the 1960s, and this new concept aims to include how a delivery mechanism or a platform can be really important that ultimately creates this learning community and better connections with an audience. So if we imagine this idea where we can connect with each other and these learning or simulated activities, um, this is where we really see this going. But I guess, Robin, it kind of asks the question about how do you actually like get into the metaverse if it's for learning or social uh, or any sort of other activity? Well, I mean, there are, I guess, a number of things to consider um, when we think about how do you get into the metaverse, so to speak. So firstly, you know, there's um, a lot of computational energy that will be required in order for you to fully experience this immersive environment. So um, you won't be able to use your phone as easily to get into the metaverse um, as you currently use it for, you know, Instagram or Twitter, for example. Um, you'll need a computer and a stable internet um, connection uh, just because the richness of the environment is going to require greater um, bandwidth and, and greater energy. Um, then there's this idea of, you know, the platform selection. So, you know, what platform you choose to get into the metaverse with will be something that to consider. Um, there's also this idea of, um, you know, like how do you get into the actual platform, the sign-in process, there's avatar uh, creation that will be required. Most of these environments do require um, an avatar-like um, kind of setup. Um, and then, you know, there's this idea of what we would now call an in-app purchase, um, but it's digital currency that will be used to be able to buy things, for example, with this, um, kind of what's called a Web3 wallet. Um, so you can have tokens that you can use to spend money and be able to buy things or sign up for concerts, for example, um, or be able to buy real estate, as Carol mentioned, or artwork. So all of that will require a currency um, that will be um, in your wallet. Then you need some form of a virtual reality headset um, because a lot of these environments are 3D. And in order for us to be able to fully experience that, headsets will be required. Right now, the technology isn't quite there yet, but there's a lot of work being developed to allow us to get there, hopefully in the um, you know near future. And then, you know, I think the final um, piece of advice that uh, we can offer is, you know, to really try it, right? Dip your toe in the water, experiment a little, go to some of the um, platforms that Carolyn has uh, previously mentioned, sign up and see what it's all about. And I think that will really um, allow you to understand, you know, a little bit about what the future is going to bring for us, as well as help you to potentially visualize how you or your organization could um, get involved. Yeah, so, and I think Robin there, the point is, is that you actually, you don't need a VR headset. This is a nice way to get involved in the metaverse, but so long as you have your computer, you pick a platform or several to go and experience and that you can sign in and create your own avatar, you can get in. You don't have to buy anything, but you can also set up a wallet. You don't need one of these, but you can explore to some limits what some of these different metaverses look like. 
So I think, Robin, we probably have some people in the audience that have probably entered one of these different metaverse platforms. So we'd love to see from the audience, just type in the Q&A box uh, if you have, yes, entered the metaverse already. And if you have, name at least one platform you've tried. And if you haven't had a chance yet, you enter a no and maybe what platform you want to give a try first. So I think that with Robin, with that, we can wrap up our primer section. Yes, yeah, so, you know, as a summary of what we've just covered, so that's a lot of content we understand, but I think the key takeaways are that the metaverse is already here in many respects and the best is yet to come, but that there's opportunities now to consider how you may want to, you know, delve into it a little bit and expose yourself so that you understand what the potential applications can be and the impact to both your organization as well as your personal lives. All right, so now that we've covered um, a background and primer really on the metaverse, Robin and I today really wanted to take you through some really good use cases of different applications or learning opportunities that the pharma industry and other related industries can take advantage of and get some maybe inspiration about how you might get involved in the metaverse um, and your organization. So for us, this covers really six key areas um, that we'll cover across these different use cases. So for us, that's medical education, internal training, clinical trial activities and visits, uh, medical science liaison interactions, sales interactions, as well as engaging patients. So this first case um, addresses medical education. It's called disease state pathways. And what it is is a immersive um, virtual learning um, program through an AI-based simulation platform. And, you know, when we think about this learner experience design wheel, this um, case really ticks the boxes in terms of allowing HCPs to have the opportunity to think about all the different uh, ways that they may be able to approach a, a particular patient um, challenge. Um, there, it also provides us with a self-directed learning solution it's a cloud-based um, format for um, delivery, so really easy to be able to um, use from anywhere. And then the uh, platform itself promotes the application of clinical knowledge and skills within a digital environment. So that really um, sets us up for being able to see how instructional design and um, the metaverse come together. Uh, another example for medical education is this really interesting concept from SurvivorNet. It's their SurvivorNet Connect Metaverse Conference. So very specifically in the oncology world, of course, data research is progressing so quickly and there's just so much available um, educational and instructional materials for oncologists that this group of developers have come up with uh, a concept in which they want to create metaverse-based education that are actually done in conjunction with some very large oncology meetings. So what we really like about this use case is saying that there are, of course, real life and physical conferences that can take place, but you can build upon that using metaverse type applications to bring together a learning community around a very fast moving, fast paced um, research space like uh, oncology. This next case is focused on internal training with the concept of um, presentation skills training for pharmaceutical um, company internal stakeholders or external stakeholders. Um, and, and really what this is really about is the idea of being able to um, help you know, speakers build up confidence in presenting. Um, so it really addresses this idea of um, addressing learner needs um, it also ticks the box of having, um, you know, an easy to use platform that can be accessible on any laptop or even uh, mobile phones. And it provides, um, you know, a dashboard that allows you to track the um, metrics of how each of these speakers are doing over time. By um, the use of AI, there's coaching that um, is interactive based on, on how a speaker comes across. And so this um, is another area that we really like about this concept because um, instructional design is really all about um, using that past you know, experience and the performance and, and, and building upon that so that the um, person who's going through this type of training gets better with each iteration of the training uh, process. 
Uh, this next example for internal training, maybe on the other end of the spectrum from communication skills training that Robin just shared, um, aims to build empathy for a particular um, group of patients. So in this specific example, the Excedrin migraine simulator, um, which is a combined effort from GlaxoSmithKline as well as DDB Remedy, uh, designed a fully immersive virtual reality experience for their sales reps and field force to allow them to better understand what patients go through when they are suffering from migraines. So the type of migraines we're actually talking about here are those that probably are lasting 10 to 15 days per month of migraine like symptoms. And this allows these sales reps to understand what these patients could be going through. Um, so this does a really, really good job in terms of the content that was created because not only do they simulate these visual symptoms that these patients may feel, they built this into a delivery platform where they actually had it tested by patients to actually confirm the accuracy of the symptoms. Now, our team and our organization has a experience with another type of simulator, and that was actually for hypoglycemic events, which based on their severity can be can lead to very, um, very poor outcomes, including like uh, unconscious uh, coma or even death. So the hypo simulator in that case was actually used not only to educate physicians or other internal teams about what a hypo may feel like, but it was also to educate patients about the onset of those types of early warning signs. So we see this as a really great example to build in the ability to use VR headsets, to simulate an activity or an event for a specific target audience so that others can build empathy around this. And for us, this is like the really good example of creating those human connections across different groups of people. Another quick example we wanted to share is around clinical trials. This uh, space has actually received a lot of um, headlines recently in the news as Amazon and Amazon Web Services has actually gotten involved in clinical trials. But a really early example of this was done by the Meta Health Youth Project, um, evaluating risk factors uh, related to non-communicable diseases. And in specifically in this case, what this group of researchers did is they identified and recruited patients and then outfitted them with a digital twin. That digital twin also had their medical records, which is a little bit slightly different from an avatar. However, because it can be more than just a person, it can also be these other assets. And they actually met with the investigators in a digital world to collect um, updates on various aspects or impacts of the interventions they were doing as part of the trial. And so why we see this as a really great example is because it also helped build a better community and relationship actually between the investigators as well as patients. So for us, that's why we put this on the list as something to take a look at as a really great use case for clinical trials within the metaverse. Okay, so this next case study is focused on MSL interactions. And this um, is the first hospital chain, Amidus Avalon. Um, it's the first hospital chain in the metaverse. And they're currently focused on patient care, but they could expand in the future to include visits from MSLs as well as other pharma reps. And the exciting thing about this is really um, this idea that you can have more um, direct and engaging interactions between HCPs and uh, MSLs um, so that we ensure that the HCPs are getting timely, accurate information that's relevant to them when they need it. And it allows more recent research to be provided by the MSLs to HCPs and the KOLs in a way that you know previously was not um, very, very well imagined, you know, so if you think about the, you know, the current way that MSLs interact with HCPs, it's, you know, visiting the hospital, it's very paper based, um, you walk through data and paper, very one way and very, uh, you know, flat in terms of how the communication and the learning is communicated. Um, if you can imagine the future where you can have a much more interactive experience with the potential for pharmaceutical companies to rent space within the hospital to have HCPs come and visit them at the booths, for example, so that they learn about the latest information that the pharma companies want to deliver. I think this is really going to be an innovation that will be welcomed by not only the HCP community, but also the um, pharmaceutical industry as a whole. 
So then if we think about if it could be supporting MSL type interactions, of course, there's a lot of opportunity for sales rep interactions within the pharma or related industries. So this example we wanted to share with the group, which was Medtronic, which is a device company most well known for insulin pumps, most likely, um, and a collaboration with Pitchboy, which is offers a 360 VR simulation. So once again, this idea was that Medtronic needed to train a uh, broad group of sales reps within their organization on very specific uh, messaging, objection handling, and really addressing real customer needs. So what we really liked about this example was that it was very much focused on the learner needs and also allowing them to scale and run their training very quickly and very effectively using this type of technology. And that we see um, these examples brought into the real world allows them to use VR and AR powered coaching to make those sales reps achieve sort of that next level interaction with their customers. So this case is really focused on patient interactions and it's uh, focused on this idea of allowing patients to manage their phobias without ever having to leave home. As you can imagine, you know, dealing with phobias is a challenging issue um, because many patients you know, need to get therapy but don't feel comfortable um, actually leaving their homes to be able to do so. So if you think about this idea of being able to use either VR or AR combination to be able to better ex uh, control the exposure that a patient has, you can already understand that this may be a much better way to be able to manage these issues. Um, you know, going out into the real world and, and encountering, you know, things like spiders or heights or, you know, even uh, phobias around um, flying in an airplane are very challenging. You know, you actually have to be in front of those phobias and and those challenges to be able to experience the exposure therapy. But in this example, you can do that all in a virtual world. Yeah, and, and then finally, maybe thinking about other challenges that patients can encounter is really around who can own that data that, that the patient actually can provide and it should be, you know, securely confidential. So this medical chain um, platform and concepts really <laughs> derived from blockchain really starts to say is that if ownership of the data can be tracked in the metaverse, then perhaps that patients can work directly with specific organizations to share their information in a really secure and confidential way instead of there being um, maybe some other collection or middle type um, organizations that um, oversee the sharing of that information and ultimately sometimes of selling it. So this is maybe a secure way that patients can have their data, track it and share it with the right people to have an impact on various aspects of research. Um, so for us, we see this really uh, ticking the box and as a good example because it looks at how decentralization of a platform can actually help enable secure, fast, and transparent exchange of information such as medical data, which is going to continue to be a really important topic as the metaverse expands around security, uh, regulations, etc. So this is a great example to dig into when you have time. So to wrap up this section, you know, I think we've learned a lot about potential use cases and, and other examples that I think will have a lot of application to the pharmaceutical industry. And, you know, I think for me, it really um, it encourages me to start to think differently about the potential of the metaverse within our industry. Uh, I think as well that it's important for us to um, be flexible, be nimble and be part of this evolution as opposed to waiting for it to happen, because I think the pharma industry really can help to drive that next best uh, use case and to help create some of this excitement that we're starting to see in many of the other industries that are starting to dip their toe into the water. So finally, Robin and I wanted to summarize today is actually how pharma can shape the metaverse. So we're really doing a full 360 here. Uh, and in fact, what we believe is we are really obviously only scratching the surface in terms of the potential um, in the metaverse and building more use cases that will help strengthen the possibilities that the metaverse will be um, and how it will exist for what is our very specialized and unique industries across pharma, biotech, medtech, life sciences, and of course, healthcare. So if we take a look a little bit into the future, what is really um, how will the metaverse will significantly impact our commercial and personal lives, including healthcare. 
So if we look at some quick stats and thinking about where we've been and where we're going, already in 2022, it's only October, um, $120 billion of investment has flowed into the metaverse. Uh, what we right, know right now in terms of active consumers within the metaverse is that almost 80% of them have made a purchase. So they are getting the wallet. They are um, using that cryptocurrency specific to each of those platforms. Um, and what's expected right now in terms of corporate revenue that will come from the metaverse in the next five years is that approximately like 15% or more could come from the metaverse alone. If we take a closer look at some statistics or or expectations in healthcare space is that by 2030, over $72 billion um, will represent the size of the healthcare market within the metaverse. And finally, on a recent survey, over 80% of healthcare executives expect the metaverse will have a positive impact on their organizations. So no doubt the metaverse is going to have significant impacts and we're already starting to see some of those expectations. So then I guess finally, Robin, what we want to look at is ask the final question is like, what if we could reimagine all of this um, and ask some of those questions about how we can get started? Yeah, so, you know, I think the first thing I would say is try it, you know, try it for yourself first and experiment. And then take on the role of educator and advocate for its use internally to so that your organization will be able will have the opportunity to at least, you know, be early adopters in this space. And then identify colleagues who are already passionate about, you know, certain aspects of the metaverse. So for example, you know, do you know anyone in your office or in your business who's a gamer, um, or someone really is into any of this kind of 3D virtual world um, type of activity? Those are great uh, colleagues who can help move the needle forward. So Carolyn, how about some of these other considerations? Yeah, maybe just to wrap it up, Robin, I think what we believe is that you start small, but start and get involved. Think about what your goals are for your organization. Think about what the needs are for your target audience and stay and stick to that. We also believe it's really important to stay true to your value proposition across your organization and your brand or multiple brands. And that also means to continue to evaluate safety, security, legal, and compliance are related to this new type of platform. And I would say finally is continue to be curious and imagine the possibilities because we also believe that then the technology will follow. It may not exist today, but it is coming. So if we remain curious and we think about these new use cases and start um, experimenting with them in the metaverse, this is the best place to start. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you, everyone, for your attention today. I think that we've covered quite a bit. Um, so we look forward to taking any questions during the Q&A. And then I also like to thank Sile for inviting us to share some of this information with you. I hope that everyone really um, got a lot out of this talk and, and hopefully um, have a better understanding of what the metaverse is and how the pharmaceutical industry can play a role in moving us forward. So thank you.